Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Angelo Di Grazia. I usually, uh, with Michael, we usually do a wrap-up of the news, and uh, I've probably got more here than the 20 minutes allocated, but I'll get into it straight away. The first thing, uh, we'll start by talking about Australia. Um, Gilmore Space, they're the talking point. There's a, a little bit of writing there, but uh, essentially, uh, Gilmore Space secures $19 million over the month and to really create its next generation hybrid rockets for space. Hybrid rockets, if you recall, are a, uh, an oxidizer, which is usually a solid of some sort, and a, something like hydrogen peroxide. Sorry, hydrogen peroxide is the uh, oxidizer and something like uh, a rubber material as the fuel. Uh, so it's trying to develop uh, low-cost launch vehicles to put medium-sized satellites in low Earth orbit and um, has actually secured funds through the CSIRO and um, it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's actually augmented from recent uh, funding that it received uh, earlier. It's developing the new rockets that uh, are meant to go into low Earth orbit. Uh, Rick uh, Baker agrees the Queensland-based rocket company is well on its way to developing, building and launching commercial orbital rockets for under $30 million. I find that hard to believe, but uh, we'll wait and see. The Queensland company is part of a growing number of uh, space startups. You know, the last count I think that Mike uh, did, there was something like about 80 across the world doing this sort of stuff. But where this is unique, it's hybrid. Um, so Gilmore Space is looking at launching some uh, suborbital in 2018 and then in 2020 fly some uh, um, uh, orbital vehicles. Since January, uh, it's completed a series of ground tests uh, of its engine, which is quite a, quite a reasonable engine, actually. It signed an agreement with NASA and attracted some senior space veterans, which really caught my eye when I read this, was uh, Colonel Pamela Malroy. She was a retired uh, US Air Force uh, uh, colonel and uh, an ex-shuttle pilot. So that was pretty cool. And, and Darva Newman, who was the former Deputy Administrator of NASA. So that's pretty, pretty interesting credentials there uh, lining up with Gilmore Space. So we're not too far away from actually flying a rocket from Australia. Queensland. It's fantastic. The Australian Space Agency, as we heard earlier in the talk, they have, uh, you know, shot out of a gun like a, like a real bullet. Uh, they've really, you know, started to set up a, a number of memorandums of understandings uh, with various, uh, various organisations. Uh, one of them, uh, strategic in intent with uh, Airbus, Defence. So that was uh, an interesting one. And that just followed the signing of a memorandum of understanding with CNS, CNES, which is the French Space Agency. So, again, Airbus has a major presence in Australia and it uh, does various um, Earth observation and satellite imaging and has been here for, for a number of years. Uh, and again, they're all committed to growing the indigenous space industry. So... It's it's very good for Australia and holds uh, you know holds us uh, in good stead. The space agency signed further agreements, such as Canada, as we heard before, and United Kingdom. Um, a lot of these, a number of these, a lot of contacts were made at the IAC, the International, uh, what's it called, Astronomical or Astron Congress, that was held in Bremen recently. Uh, so. Again, lots of action there, and there's talk, the Australian Space Agency, of getting involved in uh, the Gateway and certainly those the lunar projects that are being talked about, the lunar settlements and all sorts of uh, lunar villages and, and um, things like that. So, again, as we discussed before, it would be great to see Australia create a niche, a bit like the Canada Arm, and do something that no one can live without and we're, we're always involved. So it was really good. There's a Lunar Gateway. Um, so Australia's new space agency is focusing on the commercial space sector. It's, and I was surprised by some of these numbers. It's actually uh, the current 
uh, space industry in Australia is valued at about three billion, but it's trying to get that to twelve billion in the next twelve years, um, and also attract significant investment in the country. So that is a good thing. It's also trying to um, create a lot of jobs, twenty thousand new jobs and new business opportunities in the country. So it's a uh, it's a good effort from the Australian Space Agency. And that, and you've got to remember, they were announced a year ago, uh, the Australian government, and they've been operating since the 1st of July, and already they've uh, they've done you know quite a significant bit. It's surprised me that, uh, of the stuff that they have done. CSIRO, a roadmap to unlock the potential of Australian space economy was uh, released. So... Say again, Len, sorry? I'm not aware of that, but you're saying that, that we can. Yes. Okay, so the, uh, the comment was that you can subscribe to Australian Space Agency newsletter if you, if you like, which is good. Um, okay, so the other thing the CSIRO were looking at were, was what type of niche can we get ourselves into? And uh, there was talk about... Uh, um, Earth observations, debris tracking, uh, things things of that nature, but I'm sure more will come of it, and it uh, starts a good roadmap for where Australian Space Agency should go. So it's pretty good. The, the other one that uh, I thought was an interesting article was that uh, there was a hunter-killer satellite um, that was being worked on, and uh, the Australian National University was involved in it. And essentially, it, uh, it's a satellite that goes up, goes up next to the satellite that you want to bring down, and basically has a puff of gas at that satellite, slows it down, gets itself into a... Uh, it reduces its speed, which means if it's within that 500-kilometre uh, 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 zone, it will re-enter the atmosphere. If it's above that, can't use that technique. There's got to be others, but we'll get to that. Is that the Australian Space Force? No, it's not, it's not meant to be the Australian Space Force, but yeah, you never know. Could be. Not Rocket Lab. There it is, the electron. They've been very busy. Um, rocket Lab unveiled a new high-volume rocket production facility in Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, the new uh, rocket development uh, is designed for rapid mass production of the company's electron rocket. And when you actually see the factory, it's really quite amazing. They've looked at everything, you know, including uh, wheels on the on the trolleys that they use. I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute. And uh, they've thought of everything of how to create volumes of manufacture, volumes of rocket, rockets. Uh, it actually adds to uh, their existing facilities in Hunting, Huntington Beach in California, and the new facility enables a company to build one electron per week. Pretty amazing. Um, it has a new mission control centre also located in Auckland. Uh, it will serve uh, both launches from Complex 1, which is in New Zealand, and also the new Complex 2, which is in Wallops Island in Virginia. The new production facility will house more than 200 of Rocket Lab's growing team of 330 people, and they've actually been recruiting. So, Peter, where are you? Oh, yeah. There you go. Get your name down. You'll have to change the accent, though. I can make coffee, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and there's the new facility in Auckland, New Zealand. Pretty cool, really nice, modern, and of course, who else to sign but Captain Kirk? I think so, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, is that going to be the case in future? Excellent. Sorry? Yeah, uh, the comment was made that the engines are being manufactured still in the United States, uh, so they won't be being manufactured in New Zealand. Rocket Lab uh, recently announced Wallops Island as their American launch site. It's called Launch Complex 2, and it's right next to Northrop Grumman's Antares rocket launch, launch site. So that's planned first launch, third quarter of 2019. And it really is a bit of a boutique pad, according to the words here, uh, for customers, American customers, who really want a 
stay in the United States and launch. And there it is, turning the sod, so to speak. I've never seen so many people turning the sod. But there they are, all 20 of them. All right, let's go to Washington. NASA has a new deputy administrator. He's James Moorhead, Moorhead, sorry, formerly Deputy Sergeant at Arms for the Senate, was nominated in July and confirmed recently by the Senate. Didn't get quite the same controversy as the Supreme Court judge, so that was good. Uh, who knows? Do you have to know anything about space now? International Space Station. Boy, has it been an exciting month this month. Um, the talk is uh, they were trying to stop the space station from uh, or cease its use by 2024-25. They went out to commercial um, companies to see if anyone had any interest, and the bottom line was no. No one really had any interest. So now, both the Senate and uh, in Congress, they're talking about extending its lifetime to 2030. And uh, someone called it uh, the crown jewel of NASA's human spaceflight program. <laughs> so there you go. So, th so it looks like we'll probably see the station operational until 2030, which gives the Australian astronauts a, a hope yet of actually going up there and doing something. Um, dream on? Uh, Okay, so again, representatives from Europe, Japan, and Russia are all keen to extend the, uh, the space station. So that's that's good news. But uh, no sooner do you think it's it's safe, and we have a failure on our Soyuz FG booster for the MS-10 mission, Expedition 57, launch abort. There were two astronauts, cosmonauts on board. Uh, I don't know if, uh, Andrew, you weren't going to bring up any of this particular story. Um, well, essentially the rocket took off and everything was okay. And then at the Korolev, what do they call it? When the boosters separate and they do their spirals, there's a Korolev star, I think they're called. Uh, something didn't quite work that way. And as a consequence... One of the boosters apparently, and this is only hearsay, hit uh, the centre core and uh, caused ejection of the uh, capsule. And uh, ballistic trajectory was the result and the astronauts, cosmonauts, found their way back to a safe landing. I was told yesterday that it, this is the second time this has happened uh, in flight abort. There was a really famous one back some years back where they actually boarded pad abort. The rocket was essentially on fire, and you know someone decided to press the button. Yep. 1975. Mark Hillier says yes. Yes. Okay, so Mark just explained for those that... Sorry, Mark just explained. Pad abort was 83, Mark just explained, and 95 was the in-flight abort where the third stage had failed. Uh, sorry, okay. All right. Okay, there is any... All right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Mark, I, I want to cut you off there because the streaming audio doesn't pick this up. Um, the launch abort, the, the interesting thing is what is the impact to the space station? So it was, it was cut short. There is an inquiry going on. Uh, Roscosmos uh, got one going very, very quickly um, because, I mean, 
Clearly, if they don't get another launch up there by December, manned flight, uh, the space station risks being unmanned. And uh, NASA is preparing for it. They think they can accommodate it, but who the heck knows? So they don't really want to go down this route. So um, the recent failure, comp as it says here, complicates the future of the International Space Station. Soyuz is the only way to get up there at the moment and uh, could leave the ISS unmanned. Um, it has been continuously manned since November 2000. So, um, you know, anyone born after that date has never known a time when someone wasn't in space, as you said before. NASA's commercial crew program has actually delayed, surprise, surprise. So you can't really count on them uh, really pulling, uh, you know, sending astronauts and cosmonauts back up there. So America at the moment pays $70 million a seat, by the way, maybe more, depends on who, which uh, article you read, but they've not really got any, any they've not ordered any extra Soyuz spacecraft. So it's imperative that they get this going. So the ISS is currently underutilised because you've got two, two men missing there at the moment. Uh, NASA's safety committee has raised the concerns that the pressure is going to go back to commercial crew, right? Boeing, SpaceX, why aren't you getting your Dragon and your uh, Starliner going? And so that will be an interesting dynamic. But uh, SpaceX and Boeing are saying... No, we're going to take our time, we're going when we're ready. But the underlying pressure will be there, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, you know, I just hope it doesn't turn into, you know, a real go fever. Uh, no, they're still going. They, they can still go there. They, so I'll just come to that. So uh, Russia plans to carry out at least three launches, unmanned, and that's all they need to satisfy themselves that the Soyuz rocket, the booster, is capable of taking the men back up there. I mean, it's been a very successful rocket. I mean, it's had a glitch now, but, uh, you know, its history is quite uh, quite amazing. So they're going to be launching progress, and uh, they're going to start early November to launch some of these, and they believe that by the end of November, uh, maybe even as early as December, they might be able to send up a uh, refresh crew. So that's interesting. The other one, yeah, this is the last one. Uh, they're planning to do a spacewalk to see where the where the hole originates from. And uh, oh, look, uh, NASA, Mr. Bridenstine and uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Ragozin are all, you know, decided that they're going to put a clamp on outrageous accusations, and they will work together to come up with a solution. So you'll find you won't hear uh, those kind of accusations any further. But they are going to do a spacewalk. There's the infamous hole that was patched up and they still don't know whether it was done in space, on the pad, in the factory. That's what will happen. And, of course, Mr Bridenstine and Mr Rogozin did meet in Bacchanal to watch the, uh, the, the latest uh, <laughs> launch aboard. And, um, you know, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine said that he has a good relationship with his Russian counterpart, despite recent events and past statements. So there you go. They're all mates again. Uh, I've got about a minute to go. I'll do commercial crew. Of course, as I said before, that's an upcoming uh, um, event that we all look forward to next year. However, there they are. That's the Starliner on the left and Dragon Crew Dragon on the right, and of course there's been a two-month slip. Second quarter of 2019, we'll have a pad abort test. No in-flight pad abort, uh, no in-flight abort will be done by Boeing. And now it's June, the uncrewed flight. So that's slipped two months, and first crewed flight August, which means the Guernsey goes to SpaceX, who will be the first cab off the rank at this point to launch men from the Cape. And there, there is the Starliner with the uh, ULA's Atlas rockets with the Russian engines. Fantastic. At Launch Complex 41. SpaceX, of course, it slipped also two months. Uh, by the way, don't be surprised if this slip, these slip further. 
The safety committees are all over them because of all sorts of safety concerns. They still have it finalised, resolved, signed off. Boeing and SpaceX both keep saying, we're onto it, we're onto it, we're doing it, but um, it's a, it's a tri tricky task and I would expect delays will occur. Uh, early 2018, we're going to have a crew dragon in flight aboard. We're actually probably going to use a uh, Block 4 version of the Falcon 9 and go to it. In February, they're looking at launching the uncrewed Dragon demo, and June will be the man, man, manned launch. There it is, and there it is, there it is, and there it is. And that's it for me. Till next week, we'll continue on with this. It was. And I'll give you another little, little interesting piece of information. It is their fault uh, because they have to have the crew rotations synchronised and a lot of the SpaceX stuff, because of the Dragon is already at the Cape, uh, being integrated as we speak. It could have flown a bit earlier, but because of NASA's scheduling and whatever, they have to actually go a bit later. And it complicates life even further. If the space station does go into auto mode whilst they... They can't launch these things. They can't launch them in flight. They have to have people in the space station to coordinate the dockings and the, uh, the approach. So it had, this launch abort, the Soyuz, has had a really big impact, but the Russians and everyone else seems to be confident they'll be flying men up there before December, before the end of December. So it's a good outcome. All right, thank you. The last thing I, uh, I saw about the, the problem with the Dragon was, in fact, that there were concerns about the, the parachutes. So I don't know. They, have they you heard anything about it? They do have four parachutes. But there's some problem, apparently. Yeah. Just while Michael gets the uh, show on the road, as it were, uh, I'm going to be doing my usual monthly gallop through the space news of um, planetary style. And yeah, it works. Good. So let's see. Mm -hmm. Go forward. Right. And that's the laser. Yeah. We'll need the laser later. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Just check. Right. First up, from Cassini, some of the scientific results are now coming in from the close approaches when Cassini flew between the rings and the planet in the final days before at the end of its mission last year. And... As you can see from the picture, they have uh, discovered a new radiation belt and they've found out some interesting things about the way in which the particles spiral through the magnetosphere. And the magnetic axis is almost exactly aligned with the rotation axis, unlike the Earth when it's offset by uh, quite a bit. Now, let's see. Oh, yes. InSight is now uh, about a month away from landing on Mars, and uh, you can see this in the context of where the other landers uh, have been. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 sorry. Okay. Um, no word yet on opportunity. Uh, it's, they're still trying to contact it, but there's been no contact uh, with uh, opportunity itself. However, InSight is... Uh, now well on the way. Uh, there's a nice little graphic showing the 
seismometer that they're going to be placing on the surface. It's a French built one. Marco, the uh, Mars CubeSats, uh, show the potential that Australia could get involved in planetary science because uh, building CubeSats is well within our capabilities and uh, students could aspire to uh, build some of these and have them sent on the way to Mars, not by an Australian rocket, unfortunately, but certainly by a European or you know, Japanese, Chinese, Indian or American rockets. This is Marco, one of the Mars Cube, and the in rather intriguing design of the antenna. Rather than use a dish antenna, it's a uh, flat, uh, shouldn't really call it a phased array, but uh, it's a flat antenna of high efficiency. And that's a picture of the two of them on the way to Mars, deployed uh, just from the from the rocket just after the separation of InSight, and they're flying in parallel uh, with InSight towards Mars. And uh, they're not going to go into orbit around Mars, they're just going to fly by Mars at the time that InSight makes the landing, and the hope is that they'll be able to relay data from InSight back towards Earth. Soon after launch, they did photograph the Earth and the Moon, and uh, itself, a sort of a selfie, if you like, in the modern parlance. And uh, there's another picture of the Earth and the Moon. All right. The Mars uh, 2020 mission is uh, now well under development. And uh, there's something I was going to say about it. I've forgotten what it was, so let's go on. Uh, here's a picture from... Curiosity, a selfie of Curiosity uh, showing um, the, the terrain and uh, quite a bit. And it's a bit dark because, well, Mars is dark in the first place, but also because the, um, the dust storm is, is still uh, covering some of Mars. It's not as bad as it was, uh, but uh, it's, it's better. And, of course, the Mars... Uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has imaged opportunity on the surface of Mars as the dust storm clears. So it's in this, uh, let's see if I can, oh, there it is there, and that's, it's in this valley here. The intention was that it was going to, having explored all around this area here, it was then going to go down into the, into the crater. But, uh, oh well, we'll see if they get it in contact again. Meanwhile, the Dawn mission has uh, pretty much wrapped up its mission to the um, dwarf planet series. And interestingly enough, it has shown that these, uh, I'm going to call it salt, I won't go into the chemistry of it, uh, these salt deposits show that there has been activity, uh, hydrological activity, bringing these salts to the surface. So Ceres is not a dry, rocky place. It has had moisture, it still does have moisture there, which can bring up these salts to the surface. And uh, quite a, new, a lot of new findings are coming out about that, so you might want to look those up. Meanwhile, analysis of the uh, Galileo mission from uh, way back in the 1990s uh, and some more theoretical work has shown what causes the darkening of the surface of Europa. And it's a photochemical reaction. The plume, plumes come up, releasing chemicals from the subsurface ocean and then ultraviolet light and charged particles uh, from the solar wind and cosmic rays affect the molecules, breaking them down and forming this uh, brown material that you see on the surface of Europa. Now we come to the um, TESS mission, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey, and this is one of the first light pictures showing uh, quite some detail how each of these dots in here is a star. 
and uh, we've got the small, uh, or is it the large Magellanic cloud in the picture. So this gives you some idea of how TESS is going to be revealing uh, the this, this star fields. Some more pictures from TESS. And again, you can read from the, uh, the captions where different things are in that picture. So they're going to be looking for ch changes in the brightness of each of these little dots in this picture over a period of time before it looks at a new star field. That's uh, the one on the left is an enlargement of the uh, one of the pictures on the right. So that uh, pointer. So that sort of goes from looking down there to looking you know, way up over there. So it's uh, quite a wide field of view. Now, this is, if I've got my memory right, Parker. And we're looking here with the WISPA instrument, the Wide Field Imager for Solar Probe. Now, the right-hand side of the picture here is 58 degrees to the sun. So from here, 58 degrees out, and the sun's over here. The field of view of this is 40 degrees, and then the field of view of this other one here is uh, 58 degrees, meaning that from this side here to the sun is 160 degrees. Also in here you can see Jupiter, and you can also see over here just about the junction, uh, this is Antares in the constellation Scorpion. Now remember this is not intended to show stars, it's intended to show the solar wind. At the moment you can't see the solar wind there because it's actually pointing, uh, it's not near enough to the sun to do so yet. So that's one of the first, that's the first light picture from Parker. Here is uh, what happened when they had deployed their, um, the magnetometer. Now during launch it's stowed up close to the spacecraft and then after launch, it swings out. And you can see what happens to the magnetic field reading as it swings out, showing why you need to get the magnetometer away from the spacecraft, because otherwise it's just measuring its own magnetic field. So this uh, on the left is before it swung out, and then on the right it's after it swung out. The fields... Um, instrument... Um, also, here we're comparing the data. This, uh, by the way, is incorrectly labelled. Both of these are from the Parker Solar Probe and shows the uh, frequency of radio, uh, elect well, electric field oscillations in the plasma and the against time and the colour is intensity. Now, they issued a modified picture a little later and the top is the winds. There's a satellite called WINS, which has been doing it. That's the resolution that WINS has been getting at the top of the frame, and the bottom two are the Parker instruments. So we're getting much better resolution of the uh, solar wind. It's also able to measure the energy of the particles, uh, most of this here is uh, cosmic rays, and uh, actually, much of that is cosmic rays as well. Okay, here, here's hydrogen and helium and other particles are being measured, and their energy is being measured. By the way, EV is an electron volt, which is the energy an electron gets when it falls through an electric field of one volt. So MEV is mega electron volts or millions of electron volts. So these particles are pretty energetic. And this one here is from an instrument which is the uh, Integrated Science Investigation of the Sun. And uh, these are the cos mostly cosmic rays. And here we see that there's been a, a gust in the solar wind, 
and that's what the red colour is there in that. It's a gust in the solar wind. Fortunately, uh, it happened just after the instrument was deployed. They don't expect to measure many of these because this instrument is actually going to be tucked away behind uh, the spacecraft out of the sight of the sun. Now, this is from the solar probe analyzers, and uh, Parker was turned for 20 minutes to capture the solar wind. So we've got ions at the top and uh, electrons at the bottom. Now, we won't normally get that sort of data because this instrument will normally be tucked away behind the spacecraft out of the solar wind. Now, this is um, obviously a picture of Ryugu, the, and Hayabusa took this picture, and you can see it's Hayabusa's shadow there. Uh, there's the shadow of Hayabusa there, and the, and the uh, the sun is right behind us. Notice the South Pole here and the huge block that's at the South Pole. Now I'm going to mention some of the problems of landing shortly. So that's uh, how it rotates. North Pole at the bottom, South Pole at the top of the picture there. And these are some of the candidate landing sites that they were considering. Uh, last month I talked about the Minerva landings, and there were very few pictures published of the Minerva landing. And I came across this on someone's post on Twitter, and these guys talking about it, and up there there's a whole lot of pictures that have never been published elsewhere. At least I can't find them on the internet. So there's uh, some of the pictures that you've probably never seen before, taken by Minerva uh, on, the, on the surface of Ryugu. Now, just to remind you that Hayabusa uh, is in an orbit now uh, with uh, Ryugu, and it, uh, Ryugu's orbit takes it out just past the orbit of Mars and then nearly to the orbit of the Earth. So it's, it really is a near-Earth asteroid. Just reminding you that the architecture of Ryugu, oh, architecture of Ryugu, sorry, Hayabusa, is very similar to that of the OSIRIS-REx mission. Here's the sampling horn, and that's around about a metre long. I'm oh, sorry, half a metre long, half a metre long. So, start again. I'm inverting, inverting figures. That's about a metre long. Now, that's going to be important when I show you the next few pictures, because that's going to be the sampler down the bottom there, and it touches down and then blow some gas in and fix up hopefully some dust. But it's going to be a problem. Now this is the uh, mascot lander, which uh, landed um, since my last talk, and gives you an idea of the shape of it. And it has uh, cameras on board. There's uh, an example of one of them, how we photographed the surface, and uh, that's not showing the surface there. You can actually see the surface in the uh, in the original thing. It has a swing arm, and what that did was it suddenly went whoa, like this, and was able to tip the spacecraft and, and tumble it into a new position. And they did change the position several times. Now here's uh, the deployment of mascot, and we see here the uh, shadow of the spacecraft as it approaches. That's the Hayabusa, and Uh, you can see the uh, other spacecraft the, um, mascot there as well. All right. Now that's where it landed. The uh, blue X marks the spot where it landed. Mascot that is. There it is there in a Mercator-like projection of the asteroid. Notice how rocky the whole place is. Now, can you spot the spacecraft? Minerva. Sorry, uh, mascot, sorry. And the answer is, there it is up there. And this is taken from Hayabusa. Hayabusa 2. Can you spot the space it again? There it is. And there. So it's tumbling down in this direction.
And you see the way it's tumbling down? It's coming down this way towards the landing. Okay? Coming in that way. All right, let's move on. One of the pictures taken by Mascot showing how rocky the surface is. There's hardly any soil there, hardly any regolith. It's just mainly rocks. Now here we've got from a picture from Hayabusa and we see a mascot and the shadow of mascot. And of course the shadow of Hayabusa, which as you see from the measurements there, is about 6 metres across and 4.23 metres the other way. All right, now here's the trajectory that mascot made down to a landing there, then hit here and then bounced and tripled over to here. The uh, blue line, or the cyan line, is a, the actual trajectory on the gra projected on the ground, and the, uh, the mustard colored one is the actual trajectory in, in 3D space. Now, on the way down, Mascot was taking pictures, and on the left we have a picture taken by Mascot, and on the right, sorry, on the right we have the picture by Mascot, and on the other side here we see the field of view that Mascot got looking out that way, and that's what we see over there. That's uh, the North Pole of, uh, sorry, the North or South Pole of um, now here's another one when it's further down to it, closer to the surface and again on the left we see mark out where the field of view is and that's the view that it got mascot got and then the last one is right almost we've pretty much hit the surface we've bounced off and again we've got a field of view uh, picture there now this picture here uh, was in the mission control room and I couldn't find it posted anywhere on the internet, but then I sort of dug, did a bit of, uh, well, hacking, and I managed to find that picture, which is not published normally. Okay, so if you hack around a bit, you can find it. So that's uh, one of Minerva's pictures down on the surface. All right, now, where is it going to touch down when it does the first sampling? Well, this is the landing site. The red circle there uh, is where it's going to hopefully touch down. And you notice it's all rocky. Now they, this recovery thing, they're not going to go there and pick up rocks. They want to just get some of the dust. It's not dusty. So they've got a problem. The other thing is, of course, the thing is spinning. Uh, here's another picture uh, taken by a mascot down on the surface. Or very, say, just above the surface. And the other day it did a uh, Hayabusa did a close approach and came within 25 meters of the surface and then backed away again. And it was pretty exciting to watch that. It took about well, quite a long time anyway. Uh, here's a, a picture of the landing site, the, the touchdown site, which by the way was going to be uh, next month, but it's now been put off until after the solar conjunction, so it's not going to be until late January, early February. And that's the touchdown site. And you see, that they're finding trouble finding anywhere with a, uh, a 20 meter diameter that's clear of rocks. Real problem. This is a thermal image of the Ryugu. And you notice it looks, by the way, ignore those numbers. They are just relative uh, numbers, not actual temperatures. Notice that the North Pole, which is at the bottom, is colder than the South Pole, which is at the top, and that's because the sun is shining more on the South Pole than it is on the North Pole. So it does have see that the asteroid does have seasons. Now, just to uh, quickly rush through this, someone asked me last month what was the gravity of the on the asteroid, and I said I don't know. So guess what? I've done, sat down and just few calculations. Basically, the mean diameter of the asteroid is, uh, well, the diameter is 865 meters, 432 meters in radius. The mass is, uh, from gravity measurements, is about 4.5 by 10 to the power of 11 kilograms. Rotation period is about 7.6 hours. The hill radius 
is the distance at which if you're further than that, you can't orbit. But if you're closer than the hill radius, you can stay in orbit around the thing. And that applies to a natural satellite or an artificial satellite like Hayabusa. So the hill radius for this particular asteroid is 90 kilometers. Now the volume, okay, you work out the volume. From that you can work out the density. And I did the calculation at 1.33 um, about 10 to the power of 3 kilograms per cubic meter. And wiki, Wikipedia gives uh, 1.27. Now I've assumed, of course, that the asteroid is perfectly spherical, which of course it's not. And the, now the circumference. If you want to walk around it, you're going to have to walk 2,714 meters, so about three kilometers, not counting the boulders you're going to have to do detours around, which means that uh, carrying into account the spin, uh, circumference over period gives you a velocity at the equator of about 0.1 meter per second, and because most of you don't think in meters per second, it's about 0.36 of a kilometer per hour. So if you're standing at the surface, you're going to be going around at that speed. Or, alternatively, if you're coming in and you're landing on the thing, you're, you're going to allow for a, that velocity. Right. About two more pictures to go. Right. Now, what about the gravity? Well, the surface gravitational field strength is around about 1.6 by 10 to the power of minus 4 newtons per kilogram, or 160 micronewtons per kilogram, which means you don't weigh very much on the, on the thing. Um, at the equator, because it's spinning, if you're standing on the equator, your centripetal acceleration will be uh, about 23 micrometers per second squared, which means at the equator, if you put a 1 kilogram mass at the equator, it will weigh around about 137 micronewtons. At the poles, the weight of that one kilogram would be 160 micronewtons. So the escape velocity, if you want to jump off it, is about 0.37 meters per second, or 1.3 kilometers per hour. And that's equivalent to jumping on Earth, a magnificent height, of about seven millimeters. So if you can jump seven millimeters on Earth, no, I can go even higher than that. Um, you can go way and goodbye asteroid. All right. Now, what about a hypothetical? How fast would Ryugu need to rotate for you to feel weightless at the equator? Well, da 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 da. It would have to be around about two point six hours. 2.8 hours, sorry, uh, whereas the actual rotation, as I gave you before, is about 7.6. So, Rayuga would need to spin about 2.7, or about three times faster than it does now, for you to be weightless. And that's my presentation. Four minutes left. Well, thank you, Andrew. That was fantastic. And we finished pretty much on time. So um, that's it for this month. Thank you, everyone, for coming out um, tonight. Uh, we'd also like to thank particularly the RMIT Space Technology Association, our host here at RMIT. Um, they've uh, been setting us up and running it for helping us out each month. Um, thank you very much for our speakers. James, coming down from Queensland for tonight. It was fantastic. Um, I've got my... I'm getting Going to get running tomorrow with my astronaut fitness training. Get that up and running. And Angelo, thanks for your presentation tonight. I know you've worked with Mike on that. Um, Andrew, thank you for tonight. And also Andrew, for those who don't know, runs our weekly radio show on 88.3 Southern FM every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. You can listen to that online as well. Um, so, yes.
fantastic. I'll be looking forward to that. Um, by the way, if you, if you haven't, if you're not on our email or the mailing list or whatever, there's a sheet here just near the exit. If you'd like to put your name, phone number, and email address, we'll put you on our mailing list and you'll get a subscription to Reader's Digest. No, you won't. You'll get notifications of our meetings. <laughs> Reader's Digest. Who, how many people in the room know about Reader's Digest? Um, anyone under 30 probably doesn't know. It. What the hell am I talking about? Um, so that's it for this month. Thank you so much. Once again, one more regular meeting for the year in November. And then we've got our end of year trivia night on the 17th of December. And potentially this Friday night, if Ben wants to go along and see First Man at uh, the Sun Theatre. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Drive safe. <laughs>